Okay. All right. 2 Samuel chapter 9, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow through. In our series in the life of David, a person after God's own heart. Now, I'm calling this, this week, do you have the religion of a servant or the relationship of a son? Now, you might say, well, hang on. In the newsletter, it says, surprised by grace. That's the surprise. <laughs> I've changed the title. Okay. We're talking this morning about the life of Mephibosheth, a beautiful picture of God's grace to us in Jesus. I've preached on this before, but we're going through the life of David, so we can't leave this out. So we're going to start in chapter 9 and verse 1, where we read. Let me just turn this on. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Beautiful way to start. David got up and said, Is there someone that I can bless today? And just imagine, one of the servants of David might say something like this. Well, actually, there, there is a, a relative of Saul that um, we've noticed he's been very hardworking and uh, he's a very conscientious person, pays his taxes, honours the king, does charity when he can. Uh, we think he's worthy to be rewarded. And David would say, hang on, hang on, you, you did not understand the question. I'm asking, is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness. That word kindness in the Hebrew is the word kased. And it's probably the closest Hebrew word to the Greek word grace. It, it involves the idea of unmerited favor, mercy, pity towards those that don't deserve it. And so there's a total absence of merit but there's a presence of demerit. It's mercy to those who do not deserve it. That's what David was asking. Is there someone in the house of Saul? Saul was his enemy. Saul was the one who wanted to eliminate him, kill him, chased him for 10 years, pursued him like a dog, chased him out of the kingdom. And yet David wanted to show kindness to a relative of Saul. You know, this is a picture of our salvation. This is the picture of the grace of God. This is why we're asking the question, do you have the religion of a servant? Are you relating to God on the basis of what you think you deserve? Or do you have a relationship of a son who's received the grace of God, the unmerited favor? Amen? This is a picture of salvation. Paul, in describing salvation, says that we have been justified freely. That word freely means without a cause. Why did God choose you? Why did God save you? Why did God love you the way he did? The Bible says it was according to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, he knows why, you don't. But one thing I can tell you is that it was nothing in you and it was nothing in me that brought forth this love and this grace and this goodness of God. It was without a cause as far as we are concerned. The cause was with him. With him. Amen? And, and that word is used again um, in this verse where Jesus said, but this happened that the word may be forward, which is fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Same word, without a cause. They hated Jesus. There was nothing in Jesus that deserved to be hated. It was all within them, the hatred. Amen. It originated in his enemies, not in Jesus. Nothing in him that brought that forth. And it's like that with the grace of God. There's nothing in us that brought it forth. It's all within him. It's this chesed, this grace of God. And uh, Paul speaks about it again here, long passage here, but just look at this with me for a moment. He says, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful 
and hating one another. All demerits. All, you would say, we're disqualified. But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. And uh, this is the question that David asked. I want to bless someone of the house of Saul with this unconditional grace, this mercy. Is there someone? And one of his servants says, well, I know that he has a servant called Ziba. Let's call him forth and ask him. So they brought this man Ziba before David. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness, chesed, of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Now, for those of you that do not know the story, let me tell you what happened. When David became king, in fact, when, when Saul was killed and Jonathan was killed and David came to the throne, Mephibosheth's nurse, and Mephibosheth was five years old at the time, worked this thing out, know, knows what happens in a situation like this when a king not from that family comes to the throne, he usually wipes out everybody in that dynasty, that previous dynasty, so that there's not a coup staged against him. You understand? So he, he eliminates any potential enemies. She knew that, so she scooped up Mephibosheth and ran, but she fell and he became lame in his feet. Let's read that. We go back to chapter 4 here. Jonathan Saul's son had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. And so he became lame because not of what he had done, but of what somebody had done to him. And this woman, she had his best interest at heart, but she was totally misinformed about David. He was not like other kings. He was the total opposite. He was not someone who was going to gun down any descendant of Saul. He was someone who wanted to pursue any descendant of Saul in order to bless them. She totally misunderstood the character of David. And yet it cost this man his ability to walk and he became lame. And the Bible says that he went to a place, she took him to a place across the river Jordan in the land of Gilead, a place called Lo Debar, which means a place of no pasture, a desert, a barren place, so fitting. And for 16 years, 16 years he lived there by the time he was called before David, 16 years he'd been living there. By this time, he had a son of his own. And all during that time, no doubt, he heard, probably from the nurse who, who wanted to reflect some of the, the guilt away from herself, deflect some of the guilt away from herself, he heard something like this. The reason you are lame is because of David. The reason you live in this dump and you're stuck here is because of David. David did this to you. And so he grew up fearing David and yet hating David at the same time. Okay? That's the background to this story. And then all of a sudden, oh, another thing I've got to say is that he was ignorant about a covenant that existed that involved him. Because David had made a covenant with his father, Jonathan, that he would never harm his descendants, but he would bless them and do them good. They entered into a covenant with each other. 
to that extent. But he was ignorant of that covenant. Can you see, friends, this is a picture of many of God's people today who live under those circumstances. God has been misrepresented to them, just as David was misrepresented to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, the last person he wanted to see was David. He withdrew. He was happy to stay in low Deba rather than go across the Jordan and risk confronting David. And many Christians would rather draw back from God because they think actually that God is against them, God is angry with them, God is out to get them. They feel condemned and so they withdraw from God. It's true. And, and, and many Christians are unaware of a covenant that exists concerning them. Now let me say this, you did not make a covenant with God. And God did not make a covenant with you. God made a covenant with his son Jesus. Amen. And you are baptized into Jesus. So therefore that covenant, you become a beneficiary of that covenant because you're in Christ. So you receive all the blessings that David bestowed upon Jonathan, as it were, that God bestowed upon Jesus, you are heir to those things. Many Christians do not understand that. They are ignorant of the covenant that they're in. And so there was Mephibosheth, the other side, just trying to get on with his life, and then all of a sudden, somebody came and said, the king wants to see you. You can just imagine the blood draining out of his face and him going white as a sheet. The, the king wants to see me. Yeah, the king wants to see you. Come with me. And so he comes in fear and trembling. He's caught up with me at last. He's going to destroy me. And so he comes before David. And the Bible says this, that David sent and brought him. See, he would never have come of his own accord. He would never have come because he had no revelation of the heart of David, the goodness of David, the, the desire of David to bless him and do him good. And, and so he would never have come, but David sent and brought him. And it's the same with you and I. Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. You know, the many words that we use in the Christian life that I, you know, they're just totally unbiblical. And, 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 and we build a theology around those things. One of, one of those words is making a decision for Jesus. You won't find that anywhere in the New Testament. Have you made a decision for Jesus? The apostles never said that. You know, the gospel is God coming looking for you. You're the one that was lost, not him. Amen? He's the good shepherd that came looking for you. And Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me. There's a beautiful parable that, that Jesus spoke about. Um, he's talking about the fact that, you know, the Jews were given a chance to receive the Messiah. They rejected him. And so God was going to turn to the Gentiles until the end of the ages. We know that he's going to turn back to Israel. But, but when he talks about um, turning to the Gentiles in the parable, uh, which is the servant getting sent out to invite people to the wedding, we read this, that he said, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in, don't just invite them, bring in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Incidentally, that's, a, that's an incorrect verse, so that should be verse 21, if you're taking notes. And, and that's what the grace of God does. It draws us. It draws us in, a, in, in an irresistible way. You are here today because God brought you to himself. Isn't that beautiful? You didn't make a decision for Jesus. Yes, you believed in Jesus. The Bible speaks about having faith in Christ. But that's when the, the, the grace of God appeared to you. That was your response to the grace of God. Amen. Praise God. And you know the first thing he said to him? When he came before him, remember that the, the, the Mephibosheth is, is fearful, feeling that he's going to be killed. The first thing that David said to him is, Mephibosheth, 
called his name. Mephibosheth? The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You know, some people think that salvation is lucky dip. Let's just throw out the net and see who comes in and, you know, just numbers and herd them in. And you know what? God knows every one of us by name, every one of us intimately, even before the foundation of this world. He set his love upon us. He knows you by name. You know, some people think they can run from God, they can hide from God. If anyone thought they could hide from God, it would have been Moses. You remember when he killed that Egyptian and ran so far into the desert, just the backside of the Midian desert, and, and, and just went walkabout for 40 years. Well, that's it, I'm lost now. Nobody knows about me. Then all of a sudden, one day, there's a bush burning. And, and, and that wasn't uncommon in, in, in the desert. Bushes you know, were quite combustible when they were dry. But this bush did not burn out. It just kept burning and burning and burning. And in the end, Moses said, I'm going to go and check this thing out. And as he drew near, the voice came out. And what is the first thing that the voice said? Moses, Moses. Gotcha. <laughs> I've known all along where you've been. This is the time. Amen. Amen. Think of another man in the New Testament. Zacchaeus. A crooked tax collector. Everyone hated him because he ripped off his fellow countrymen working for the Romans. But he thought he could hide up in a tree and just get a glimpse of Jesus as he passed by. But as Jesus passed by, Zacchaeus, <laughs> Zacchaeus, gotcha. Amen? 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 Praise God. Saul is another one. Hater of Jesus. Hater of Christians. Hater of the church. Even killing Christians. And he's on his way to find a few more Christians to round up in Damascus. And all of a sudden he gets thrown to the ground. And hears the voice, Saul. Saul. Ah, oh, I love it. God knows every one of us by name. Praise God. And, and, and then the next thing he said was the thing he needed to hear the most. David said to him, do not fear. Do not fear. God does not want us to be afraid of him. Somebody comes up and says, oh, hang on a minute there, brother. We need the fear of God. Yeah, we do. We need the fear of God. You need to understand what the fear of God is. The fear of God, the Bible says, is clean. It's not dirty, it's clean. The fear of the Lord is not this cringing fear that makes us draw back from God. The fear of God is this incredible respect we have for God the reverence we have for him, the love and the appreciation that we have for him. We don't want to hurt him. We don't want to do anything that's going to displease him because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts and we don't want to sin against that love. That's the fear of God. Amen? And, and we used to have the other fear, the fear that was afraid of God, the fear that was certain he was going to crush us. But praise God, we don't have that. Paul says this, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Again, we had it once. We don't want it again. We don't want to bring that over into the new covenant. Amen? It doesn't belong there. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Mephibosheth, do not fear. I will surely show you, here's that word again, chesed, kindness, for Jonathan, your father's sake. Why is he going to show him kindness? Because of Jonathan's sake, not because of his sake. It's nothing to do with him. It's all because of Jonathan. Amen? And God is going to bless you and me in the new covenant. Why? Not because of you. 
In fact, in spite of you. <laughs> but because of Jesus. Jesus has qualified you for every good thing. See, we're asking the question this morning, do you have the religion of a servant or the relationship of a son? The religion of a servant always feels they need to be qualified. They need to do things to be qualified for God's blessing. Everything God wants to do in your life has already been paid for at the cross. Everything. Not just your forgiveness and your righteousness, but everything beyond that. Let's have a look at this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also, freely, without a cause, give us all things? Amen? Amen. Praise God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, which is in Christ. And what? All these things shall be added to you. Praise God. Hallelujah. For Jonathan's sake, for Jesus' sake, we are blessed. Okay, he goes on to say, uh, let's go back there. Uh, and I will restore all the land of Saul, your grandfather, I will restore it all. In fact, if you look at the, the, the passage, if you read through in, in 2 Corinthians 9, it says, not only am I going to restore this, but you won't even have to work for it. You've got an inheritance. You don't have to work for it. Because Zeba and his servants will work the land for you. Now, I'm not saying that there is no work in the Christian life, that there's no... There's no um, uh, ministry and there's no walk and all those sort of things. But you know, it's, it's, there's a difference between tending and toiling. When God created the world, he said to Adam, now tend the garden. There was work, but it was effortless in the sense, what's the difference? The difference is this, he did not have to make things happen. He was not the cause he was the instrument, but not the cause. God was going to make it happen. I marvel, you know, I, I, I just marvel when I see a seed planted in a ground, and then what comes out of that? How, how does that happen? You know, out of a seed, vegetables or fruit or a tree, flowers will come from a seed. Where did that, how did that happen? God. Amen? It's a miracle. We plant, we water, but we don't know how the seed works with the soil and the light and the rain and the sunshine and so on to bring forth this incredible harvest. It's God does that. And, and, and I'm so glad that I've been set free from that in ministry. We preach, we pray, we counsel, we serve, but God gives the increase. Amen. Leave the results to God. Amen. So there's no toiling, there is attending but there's no toiling. And he says this, you shall eat bread at my table continually. Now get that because what David was saying is, hey, I'm not just inviting you here for a meal. I'm incorporating you into my household. You're coming, yes, to my table, but you're not going back. You're not going back to that desert. You're not going back across the Jordan and Jesus has taken, God has taken us out of Adam and he's put us into Christ. We eat bread now at his table continually. In fact, I think if, if you count, it says it's something like four times in this passage that that's what he was going to do, was to eat bread at David's table continually. Praise God. How did... Mephibosheth respond to that. Remember, this was a man that turned up in fear, thinking, I'm going, to, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. But then all of a sudden, the king calls his name, tells him not to be afraid, tells him all the things he's going to do for him. All of a sudden, this fear begins to subside. This burden lifts. And faith begins to rise in his heart. And he begins to believe these things. And, and the Bible says, um, 
that he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? See, he started to get it. He started to understand that he was not called there to be slaughtered, but to be blessed, to be lifted up. And he says, I'm so unworthy of this. And, and, and you know, a lot of people in ministry think that it, it's fear that will get people to change. If you get them afraid of God, you, you speak the fear of God into them, you, you guilt trip them and, you know, condemn them and all that sort of stuff, then they'll ship, ship, not ship up, but shape up. You know? The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repent. It's the goodness of God that softens our heart. And that's what was happening here. His heart was being softened and drawn to the heart of David. He said, who am I that you should do all this for me? Notice though that he still calls himself a servant when David's just told him he won't be serving. <laughs> He's got servants to serve for him. And then he calls himself a dead dog. How does David respond to that? The king called to Ziba. In other words, he didn't respond to Mephibosheth. He's not going to countenance that sort of thing. You know, some people think if you grovel before God, God, I'm just such a worm. Worm, you wouldn't, I don't know why you love me and you put up with me. I'm such a wretch. They think that's spiritual. But actually, what Jesus did at the cross transformed you from being a worm and a dead dog to being a son and daughter of the Most High God. So you don't honor God by calling yourself a dead dog and groveling in the dust. You know, just understand what God has done for you and, and give him glory by stepping into that. Anyway, the king called Ziba, Saul's servant. Now, in this passage, there's a great contrast between Mephibosheth the son and Ziba the servant. Okay, let's have a look at what David said to Ziba, okay? The king called to Ziba, Saul's servant. Okay, so it's underlined all the way through that he's the servant, he's the servant. And he said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to his house. Let's have a look at a few verses here. There was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. That's the mind of a servant. They come to God, what do you want me to do, Lord? What have I got to do to get something from you? What's the sacrifice I've got to make? What's the service I've got to offer in order to be blessed? At your service. Verse 3. Then the king said, is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is a son a son of Jonathan, who is lame in his feet. Now he says to Ziba, you therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him. And you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. See the difference? But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for, the ki as, sorry, as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. What a contrast. Nothing but commands to Ziba the servant. Servant. Nothing but grace to Mephibosheth, the son. Amen? And, and, and you know, the mentality of a son is completely different to the mentality of a servant. A servant is in the household on the basis of his service. He's there to serve. And as long as he serves well, he stays in the house. 
Amen? But if the, if the master is not happy with him, he's down the road. He's out. He's fired. Get next. Bring another servant in. And, and Jesus said, a, a son abides forever. See, the son is in the house because of his position. Because of his relationship. Once a son, always a son. Might not be a good son sometimes. Might be a bad son. Still a son. You can be born, but you can't be unborn. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and so there's a difference in mentality between a servant and a son. And so I'm asking you, have you got the religion of a servant? Which is that, what have I got to do to get God to do something for me. You think that way? Or have you got a relationship of a son who knows that God has a covenant with Jesus and because of that covenant, you are blessed? Hallelujah. You know, another thing about Zeba is that when, when David called him and asked him, is there anybody left of the house of Saul? He said, well, there is a man, but he's lame on his feet. You know, you know what? A servant always draws attention to the flesh because it's conscious of its own flesh. It's working in the flesh, and so flesh compares with flesh. Well, there is this man called Mephibosheth, but he's lame. Draws attention to his lameness. Whereas David brings him to the table... And under the table, you cannot see his legs. You only see what's on the table. Amen? Amen. It wasn't his walk that brought him to the table. Somebody brought him to the table. It wasn't his walk that kept him at the table. It was all grace. And when you're at the table, nobody sees your lameness. You just see what's on the table. And that's what God wants us to see. You know, when I, when I started to get the revelation of grace, it changed my ministry. I said, Lord, what do I do now? I can't condemn people anymore. I can't manipulate them. I can't guilt trip them. What's left to do? <laughs> and God said, bring them to the table. Bring them, show them what's on the table. The riches of God's grace to us in Jesus. And so, one week, we look at the righteousness of Christ. You know, here's a beautiful dish for you. Do you know what it means to be righteous in Christ? So we unpack that. Well, it takes more than one week, doesn't it, to do that? Then we talk about the fact that not only are you righteous, but you're holy. We look at the holiness of God, that you are set apart unto Him. We look at the fact that you are a son of God, no longer a servant, but you're in this beautiful, intimate relationship with God where he opens his heart, he, you hear his voice, he speaks to you. Amen? And, and, and you know, we, we talk about being adopted into his family, and on and on it goes. Still going. I'm still going by the grace of God. There's so much on this table. Amen? Praise God. Okay. Now, There was a sequel. There is a sequel to this story. We just quickly go through it. You know that um, down the track, one of David's sons, Absalom, led a rebellion against David and took the throne from him. And David was chased out of the kingdom. We're going to look at that in detail in the weeks to come. But as he was going out of the kingdom, different ones came to support him. And this is what we find. Zeba is there. Zeba, the servant. When David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Zeba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys and on them 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 summer fruits and a skin of wine. So he had his men to feed and Zeba brought out all this food to feed him. And the king said to Zeba, what do you mean by these, or to do with these? So Zeba said, the donkeys are for your, the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, and where is your master's son? 
And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's staying in Jerusalem, for he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. And so Mephibosheth, it looks like he's done the dirty. See, people say, see, that's the problem with grace. It's a license to sin. It doesn't change you. Need, you need the law. See, Zeba's the guy that's there. In the end, the servant. He's the one that shows up. He's the one that's got the goods. Where's Mephibosheth? He's become a traitor. He's gone on to the other side. So the king said to Zeba, here, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before you, that I may fa find favour in your sight, my lord, O king. Okay, we'll go forward a little bit, because we know that uh, that rebellion was overthrown. As you've heard me say many times, anything that's taken by stealth is short-lived. God doesn't give it to you, don't take it. Amen. So Absalom was overthrown, he was defeated. And the king comes back into the kingdom. Who's there to meet him now? Mephibosheth. He had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed. From the day the king departed, he went into mourning. Until the day he came again in peace. So it was when, the, when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, my Lord, O King, my servant, deceive me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey, that's himself, Mephibosheth, I will saddle a donkey for myself, that I may ride on it and go to the king, because your servant is lame. But what happened when Ziba heard that? He was the one that got everything ready and scarpered, cleared off before Mephibosheth knew about it and could get on the donkey and go to the king. Left him there. He was lame. Nothing he could do about it. And he has slandered your servant to my lord the king. Now look at this. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your eyes. You know what to do. For all my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet you set your servant among those who eat at your own table. Therefore, what right have I still to cry out any more to the king? He's saying, I'm not here asking for anything. So the king said to him, why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said you and, your, you and Ziba divide the land. Now, it looks like David saying, well, I don't know who to believe. I don't know who to believe. All I know is that Zeba was the one that was there when I was going out. He was the one that blessed us with all these provisions and so on and so on. But now I see that, yes, you have been in mourning. You haven't shaved. You haven't looked after yourself from the day that I went out. You're disheveled and, and you're just, you know, in, in, in a state of mourning. I don't know who to believe. Divide the land. 50-50. Now... Do you remember somebody else that did that? Solomon. His son. You ever wonder where Solomon got that from? <laughs> the chip off the old block. Remember when the, the, those two ladies came and uh, uh, one of the, you know, they both had a child and one of them laid on top of a child in the night while she was sleeping and then took the other one and they both came before the king. It's my child. No, it's my child. It's my child. So the, Solomon said, okay, cut, <laughs> cut it in half. <laughs> cut it in half. Go and have half each. What do you want, the top or the bottom? <laughs> and so the real mother cried out, no, give my child to him. Don't, don't kill it. The other one said, no, it's all right. Fair's fair. Let's cut it in half. <laughs> So I said, that's the mother. That is the mother. So he was revealing the hearts. And David was revealing the hearts. 50-50. What did Mephibosheth say? Then Mephibosheth said to the king, rather let him take it all. Inasmuch as my lord, the king, has come back in peace 
to his own house. You know what he says? If I have all the blessings of the land and the, you know, the material things, but the right king is not on the throne, then my life is miserable. The only thing I want is for the right king to be on the throne. Let him have it all. Let him have everything. I'm just so glad that you are back on the throne. Wow. What, is that? what does that tell you? Amen? You know, as I was thinking about that, I, I thought about that, that verse when Jesus said this. Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Now, this is my thought, my reflection on that. I think we're living in days where we have a church without Christ. A Christless Christianity. And I can never, never, never understand how people can be happy with church without Jesus. When Jesus isn't the, the focus, when Jesus isn't the living bread that's being fed, the living water that's being supplied, where, where Jesus is not the very centre which everything revolves around him. Amen? And yet, the Bible says that that day would come, and it's here. It's called the Laodicean age, where Jesus stands actually outside the church, knocking. And the, the, you know that that church says, "We are rich. We are increased with goods. We've got everything. Everything except for Jesus." And and that's like a test. It's like a test, friends, to you and me, to your heart and my heart. Are you happy to have everything? Are you happy to have a, a Christianity now that is so stacked up with these are the blessings you can have, you can have anything you want, anything you ask for, uh, anything, you know, on demand, uh, but somehow there's something missing. And it's a relationship with Jesus. Amen? Give me Jesus. You can have the rest. <laughs> Amen? Well, thank God. I mean, he blesses us with Jesus. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is that, <clears throat> is that Christianity can come to a place where the blessings replace Christ, where the gifts replace the giver. But it's Jesus, the right king on the throne, that is good enough for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, we know that there are different layers and different aspects of your word that has gone forth today. And I just pray that you'll give food in season to those that are weary. Appropriate food, Lord, for the one that is seeking your word and seeking to be satisfied inwardly. Lord, we know that you are the living bread and you are the living water. And Lord, if we drink of this well, we will never thirst again. Lord, I pray that you'll not only bring us to the table over and over again, but continue to show us the riches of your grace given to us in Christ, that we might be satisfied to sit at your table. Let that be enough for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. It is finished.